Good morning and welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'd like to welcome you this morning, this beautiful Sunday morning, to a time of reflection, opening our hearts to the Spirit, studying the Scriptures, and allowing God to just really speak to us today. And we're just looking forward to what the Lord wants to do in our hearts and in our lives today. What number? 42, all right. <laughs> let's all stand together, turn to page 42 in our hymnal, and let's sing, All Creatures of Our God and King. We'll not sing verse 3. One, two, four, and five. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Alleluia, alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him. praise you collectively this morning. We worship you. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. And Lord, we love you. And we just bless you today. We thank you that you've gathered us here. And Lord, we thank you that you're going to speak to us today. Have your hand upon Pastor Chuck. May he bring your word in power and in the spirit this morning. Lord, we pray you'd bless all that happens on these grounds today. Father, we pray that because you're good, You'd bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Worship and praises raised from my heart all day long. Oh, my Lord. 
gather around today. We've come here not just to attend church. We've come to gather around you. Not just to sing to you or about you, but to touch you and hear your voice. We've come to worship, and that means to hear your voice and do what you say, strengthened and empowered by your spirit. We've come to worship you. Worship you. We've come to worship you, my Lord. We've come to worship you.
not a place I can go that you won't be with me always with me so I'll surrender my way I'll surrender my life every day so Lord help me rest you 
Because you first love me We give thanks with a grateful heart Give thanks to the Holy One Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son, gives thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Sing it. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has Now, if you want to reach back and get your Bible, let's turn in our Bibles to the 51st Psalm. I'll read the first and the odd-numbered verses, and Pastor Brian will lead the congregation in the even-numbered verses through Psalm 51. This is a Psalm of David after Nathan the prophet had come and had rebuked him for his sin with Bathsheba. And suddenly David discovered that that which he thought he had done in secret was not in secret, that God knew all about his sin. And so David prayed, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, According unto the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. And then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. 
The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. And then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with the burnt offerings and the whole burnt offering. And then they shall offer bullocks upon thine altar. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, that there is forgiveness with thee. That as we cast ourselves upon the multitude of thy tender mercies, when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, we come to you today and we stand before you, Lord, recognizing that there is nothing hidden that you do not see. And Lord, we just pray that our hearts will be contrite, broken over our sin. And as we confess our sin to you, Lord, we ask for the forgiveness and the cleansing through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Looking forward to the baptismal service on Friday of this week. In the evening, we encourage you to come on down and enjoy some fellowship. Uh, you can bring uh, your hot dogs and all around the uh, fires and we will start baptizing around 6.30. So if you have not yet been baptized, it is the commandment of the scriptures. Uh, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. When they said to Peter, What shall we do since we've crucified the Lord of glory? He said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Many of you have gone forward and have gone through the sinner's prayer. That's not the end of it. That's the beginning of it, the beginning of your walk with the Lord. The next step is water baptism. And so we would encourage you to come on down Friday night, Corona Del Mar Main Beach for the baptismal service. We go from the main beach over the rocks to what is called Pirate's Cove for the baptism. Tonight, as was announced, we'll be studying Leviticus 11 through 14. And so we encourage you to read that over and be with us tonight at 7 o'clock as we continue our journey through the Bible. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 14th chapter, verse 2 where the Lord declares, this shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. It is interesting to me that God would provide a law for the leper in the day of his cleansing because from a natural standpoint, Leprosy in those days was incurable. So God is actually making an allowance for him to do what could not be done naturally. When a person once had leprosy, it was actually sort of a death sentence because the leprosy would progress until it hit a vital organ. But for God to provide a law for the leper in the day of his cleansing, God was giving himself that freedom to override the natural laws and to enact a supernatural law of his grace and mercy upon an individual 
to be cleansed from their leprosy. One day a rich young ruler had come to Jesus asking for the way of eternal life. And after a short conversation, Jesus said to him, if you want to be complete, perfect, go and sell everything you have. Distribute the money to the poor. Come and follow me. You'll have great treasures in heaven. But the man went away sorrowful because he was very rich. And Jesus, turning to his disciples, said, it's so difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Actually, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Peter then, in astonishment, said, Lord, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You see, your salvation, as far as you are concerned, is an impossibility. You can't save yourself. All of your good works are as filthy rags in God's sight. There is no law, there are no rules that you can abide by to cause you to be acceptable and to receive forgiveness from God. It is God leaving the door open for him to exercise his mercy and grace, making that which is impossible by human standards a possibility for us, the washing and the cleansing of our sin. So much like the leper, where there was no human way for him to be cleansed of his leprosy, God left the door open for him to exercise his mercy and grace and to cleanse the leper and thus be restored to his family and to society. And thus the law for the leper in the day of his cleansing. Leprosy has been used as a type of sin. Many analogies between leprosy and sin. It destroys by a slow rotting process. Even as sin is destroying by a slow rotting process. It leads ultimately to death. It is like having a sentence of death upon you when it is discovered that you have leprosy in those days. It deadens the senses. One of the first things leprosy does is to destroy the nerve cells in the body. And because the nerve cells are destroyed, you feel no pain. Uh, you look at a person who has had leprosy for a long time, you see that maybe he is missing his hands, missing his feet, or missing part of his face, his nose. And you think, oh, that must be so painful. No, it's not painful at all. They don't feel pain because the leprosy deadens their senses. Even as sin deadens a person's senses, the sin is destroying their lives, but they're not even aware of it. A, a leprous person, if he has, say, leprosy in his hand, he could put his hand in a fire and not feel it. And, and the flesh would be burned, but he wouldn't feel it because you lose your sense of feeling. And I see people in sin who have become so insensate. They've become so hardened. They don't have feelings anymore as sin has a way of destroying a person's feelings. It used to be that they thought that leprosy actually ate off a person's fingers, ate off their toes, ate off their hands. But later it was discovered that because they have no sense of pain, no sense of feeling, that rats would be drawn at night by the smell of the rotting flesh, and as the rats would actually eat off 
their toes and eat off their fingers, but because they had no sense of pain, they didn't realize it. Leprosy begins at the extremities of the body and gradually rots away until it hits a vital organ. And sin will rot away your life slowly until it finally reaches your heart. And at that point, you become totally given over to sin. Leprosy is always progressive. It is only in the last 60 years that once Dr. Hansen had discovered the leprosy bacillus that they were able then to develop medicines that arrest leprosy so that a person who has leprosy today can have it arrested by taking certain uh, medicines and uh, they can live a normal life. They don't have to be ostracized anymore. No longer need for leper colonies, but they can live a normal life uh, and uh, they can arrest the leprosy and uh, clear it up uh, in four to five years. Uh, the, the blotches and so forth can be cleared up and it is no longer progressive. But in those days, without the medicines, leprosy was progressive and it couldn't be stopped. Uh, that has changed in the last 60 years uh, with the uh, development of the medicines after Dr. Hansen discovered the bacillus. Leprosy in Bible days, according to the law that we have here in chapter 13, cause the person to be claimed unclean. Everything he touched would be unclean and have to be washed. His clothes that he had worn had to be burned. And he had to cry out, unclean, unclean, when anybody approached him uh, because he had to leave his family. He had to leave his home. He had to move outside of the city. The lepers usually lived in the garbage dump and survived off of the garbage that was poured over the wall at that section of the city. And uh, it was a loathsome disease. It was really a sentence of death upon a person when the priest had discovered that they had leprosy in their body. Just as sin has a way of polluting everything around it, a sinner has a way of polluting the atmosphere with his language, uh, with his actions. Uh, they are a degrading, polluting kind of influence, sort of like cigar smoke. Uh, it seems to just spread and, and smell up everything. Uh, we used to have a waterman that delivered water to our house when we were living in Huntington Beach and he would bring it in on the back porch and put the water in the container, you know, put the bottle in the container. And he always had this cigar in his mouth. And, and we could always tell, even if we were not at home, we could always tell, well, the waterman delivered water today because it left that uh, smell. You know, you could walk in the front door and, and smell the fact that the waterman had been there uh, because uh, even though it was on the back porch, it just had a way of sort of spreading. So one day our little boy, well, he was little then, Jeff uh, was at the back door when the waterman came in. He said, waterman. He said, my mama doesn't want you smoking cigars in her house. It stinks up the whole house. And so he apologized and, and after that never smoked a cigar in the house. But even so, when he had been there, you could still smell it. There was just that residue that, you know, it, you walk by and it's, whoa, you know. And, and, but so is sin. It just seems to have that kind of way of, of just 
permeating wherever it goes. Leprosy in those days was incurable and yet God made the law for the leper in the day of his cleansing. This tells us that God can do what no man can do. He can cleanse a man from leprosy and God can cleanse a man from sin. And so, looking at the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing, the first step was the priest had to come outside of the camp if a man felt that he was cleansed of his leprosy. The priest would have to come outside of the camp and he would examine him. And if upon examination he found that the skin of his whole body had turned white, he would then be brought into a room where he would stay for seven days and examined again by the priest. And if it was still the same condition, the priest would pronounce that he is clean. But in order to be restored to the family and to society, there was this law for the leper in the day of his cleansing. He was to bring two birds, scarlet, cedar wood, and hyssop to the priest. The one bird would be killed over running water. The water and the blood of the bird mixed together was caught in a clay bowl. Then the hyssop and the cedar wood the scarlet and the other bird were dipped in the bloody water. It is interesting to me that when Jesus was on the cross, he cried, I thirst. And they took hyssop and dipped it in vinegar and put it upon his lips. There is something about the hyssop, and I don't know what the significance is, but you remember in Egypt, when the Lord passed through and the firstborn were slain, the Israelites were told to take the blood of a lamb, put it in a basin, and take a hyssop bush and sprinkle the lamb upon the lintels and the doorpost of the house. David in the psalm that we read this morning said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. So there is a tie between the hyssop and the cross of Jesus and just what it is, I'm not certain. But the fact that he also brought cedar wood, I do believe when we get to heaven, we'll discover that the cross upon Jesus hung, that it was of cedar wood. But the leper in the day of his cleansing was to bring the cedar wood, the hyssop, the two birds, and uh, the one bird killed, and the other bird dipped then in the bloody water and released by the priest. And then the priest would declare that he was clean. We remember, of course, when Jesus was crucified, the Roman soldier thrust his spear through the heart of Jesus and there came out bloody water. For a moment, I want you to put yourself in the sandals of that leprous man. You've noticed a little blotch on your hand. You don't think anything of it until after a week or so, that blotch is still there. It doesn't seem to go away. And you notice that in the blotch, the hair is turning white. And so you go to the priest and he examines you. And seeing the blotch and the hair that is turning white, he set you in a room for seven days. At this end of the seventh day, he examined you again. If the blotch is still there and growing and the hair is turned white, then he declares, you are unclean.
clean. That is like a death sentence. It means that you have to go home, you have to pack up, you have to move out of the house, you have to leave your family, uh, you, you're just pronounced unclean, and you have to live outside of the camp of God's people having been declared unclean. Your plans, your hopes for the future are suddenly wiped out. You face a life of isolation. You can't get near your friends. You can't kiss your children anymore. You can't embrace your wife. You've been declared unclean. If anybody approaches you, you have to cry out a warning, unclean, unclean. You become separated from your loved ones. But after a few years, you wake up one morning and you look at your skin and it is all turned white. There's a surge of excitement. You send for the priest and he comes out and examines you and he then brings you in and puts you in the room again and after seven days upon seven, the second examination he sees that the skin has turned white. You're beginning to heal. He pronounces you clean. You are clean. And can you imagine the emotions that that person must have felt after years of isolation, after years of hopelessness, to hear the words, you are clean. It is then that you bring the two birds. The one is killed, the blood mixed with the running water under which the bird is killed. And then the other bird is dipped in that bloody water and the priest releases it and as it flies away the blood splattering and sprinkling down on you you're just there excited you're free you're free from that sentence of death you're free from the ostrac being ostracized from the family of God and God's people you are now able to participate with them once again and live as a normal human being. Can you imagine the emotions that one would feel when suddenly they realize they've been cleansed and they're free again to be a part of the society? It's no doubt the same emotion that David felt when his friend Nathan the prophet came to him after David had sinned with Bathsheba and the prophet gave to David a little story and when David heard the story he said concerning the villain of the story that man will surely be put to death and Nathan said David you are the man and David said, I have sinned. And the prophet said, God has forgiven your sin. And that is when David cried, Oh, how happy is the man whose transgression is forgiven. Oh, how happy is the man whose sins are covered. It's a terrible thing that sin is doing to your life. It's eating away. It's put you outside of the family of God. It's filled your life with uncleanness. But you may not even be aware of it because your senses have been deadened by your sin. And the uncleanness begins to spread throughout your whole body. But Jesus Christ comes outside of the camp not to inspect to see if you're clean but unlike the priest he comes outside the camp to cleanse you and if you'll just call upon him he'll come and he'll cleanse you of your sin 
and all of the effects of that sin. And you can hear the glorious words of Jesus saying to you, your sins are forgiven. Be free from that power that has been destroying you. The Bible tells us if we say we haven't sinned, we only deceive ourselves, the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today, you can be free from that power of sin that has held you in bondage. The heavy load of guilt can be lifted and you no longer need to be separated from God's family but can know the joy of fellowshipping with God and the people of God. Finally, the priest took a part of the bloody water and he put it upon the tip of the leper's or former leper's ear, put it upon his right thumb and put it upon the large toe of his right foot. That was to pronounce him cleansed by the blood. Your ear is now to be open to the things of God. Your hands are now to be engaged in the work of God. You've been cleansed from the works of the hands that were once polluted by sin. And the walk in darkness has now been cleansed. You're forgiven. The priest also had a pint of oil and he would pour the oil upon your ear and upon your right thumb and upon the large toe of your right foot. The oil was a symbol of the Holy Spirit's power for service. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be witnesses unto me. The power in serving the Lord. The idea being, now that you've been cleansed from your sin, you have been freed from the sentence of death. You now have a glorious new life, a life of fellowship with God. You've been freed from the power of sin that was destroying you and destroying those around you. But now you're free to serve God. It doesn't mean you're just free to do your own thing. And, and, and the Bible doesn't really indicate that we are free to just now do our own thing. We've been saved to serve. And thus the anointing with the oil of the ear, the thumb, the feet. That my ear might be anointed to hear the voice of God guiding and directing me in his path. That my thumb might be used the hands serving God, anointed service for God, and that my feet anointed to walk now in the ways of the Lord and in his path. As Paul the Apostle said, don't you realize that your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. I've been washed and cleansed by Jesus Christ from the sin that was destroying me, from the death sentence that sin had brought upon my life. But having been cleansed by Jesus, I now owe my life to him. It is a life now of dedication and commitment to Jesus. And that's what it's all about. Giving yourself now to serve him. To live for him who died for you. Let's pray. Father, 
we thank you for your grace and in the creating of the law for the leper in the day of his cleansing allowing Lord that room for you to work through grace and mercy your plan of love upon that poor man's life we thank you Lord for the provisions that you have made for us that we might be cleansed from sin and its defilement in our lives. Lord, we see what a destructive effect sin has upon people. How wonderful it is, Lord, to be set free, to hear your wonderful words, you're clean, you've been forgiven. Lord, there are those today who are being destroyed by sin. It's taken its toll upon their marriage, upon their lives. It's eating away. And Lord, they've become insensate. They don't even realize how desperate their needs are. Lord, today, speak to their hearts. Open their ears. Let them hear your voice. Let them turn from their sin. Turn unto Jesus Christ, a great high priest, who can declare them clean, forgiven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front this morning. And God is speaking to many of your hearts concerning the sin in your life. There's an interesting thing about the brain in the back part of your brain is the pleasure senses. And that's where the brain is simulated in this pleasure center. And your desire for the thrill, the pleasure, the excitement can is, is felt and you feel it there in the back part of your brain. But it becomes so strong. The reasoning part of your brain is in the frontal portion. But the pleasure stimuli can become so powerful that it overcomes the reasoning capacity. This is that deadening sense that we were talking about. So that you're not aware of what's really happening. Your desire for pleasure exceeds even your rational uh, ability to judge what this thing is doing to you. A, a person who, say, gets involved in pornography, that gives a shot to the pleasure uh, senses back there, and it overcomes your reasoning capacity. You can't realize what a disastrous effect that's having upon your wife to have you lusting after the body of another woman. And you can't look at that rationally, but your, your brain is desiring and demanding that, that kick, that, the, you know, that shot. And, and so it is with alcohol, so it is with drugs and all, that people lose their reasoning capacities as they get deadened by the effect of sin in their minds. And so the Lord can help you. He can, again, cause you to reason. And that's what God called you to do. Come now, he said, let's reason together, saith the Lord. And he can awaken that part of your brain to see what sin is doing. 
And I pray that even at this moment, God will awaken that part of your brain to realize that you're not getting by with your sin. It's destroying you. And your uncleanness is causing others around you to become unclean. But God has created a fountain of cleansing for sin. And he's inviting you to come today. Because like that bird that was dipped in the bloody water and released and flew away, you can be freed from the power of sin that's been destroying your life. The pastors are down here to pray for you. And we would encourage you to come and to be prayed for that God by his spirit might just wash and cleanse and you can hear those wonderful words, you are forgiven, you're clean. As soon as we're dismissed, rather than exiting the sanctuary, we would encourage you to come forward and to receive the cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that can cleanse a man from all sin. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep, thee. and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give